Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Shrikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. So we are well into the eleventh week of our lectures on nonlinear and adaptive control, and uh, by now we've learned quite a bit of adaptive control. Um, we've covered a large breadth of the theory of adaptive control design and analysis and i really hope all of you have learned uh, enough material by now to be able to apply and design algorithms to drive autonomous systems such as the spacex satellite that you see in our background now uh, in this uh, week we have started to look at a new paradigm in adaptive control um, until uh, the week before this we have always been uh, looking at um, persistence of excitation for learning of parameters in adaptive control uh, we never really promised parameter convergence in, in our typical analysis we always uh, were more or less concerned with only tracking uh, of the errors uh, sorry tracking of the system states to the true uh, or the desired states um, but of course, parameter learning is also a key aspect, and uh, we did spend a decent bit of time looking at persistence of excitation, uniform complete observability, integration lemmas, and things like that, uh, which uh, sort of um, are what help us to prove a convergence in the persistence of excitation domain. Um, but now, starting this week, we have been looking at uh, initial excitation based adaptive controller where you have essentially two layers of filters on your regressor and your control and because of this somehow not somehow but interestingly i would say um, the update law design becomes simpler and also has nice negative terms in theta tilde itself which is not usually present in uh, typical p based adaptive control right uh, typical certainty equivalence adaptive control does not contain any theta tilde term of course there is a theta hat term in in sigma epsilon modified adaptive controls but you know that those have deteriorated performance even in absence of disturbances all right so uh, so this is rather nice yeah rather powerful and we also of course show that v dot become negative definite in the presence of initial excitation of course, if there's no initial excitation, there's no persistence excitation, then you will end up in the same kind of trouble in the presence of disturbance. Yeah. So, um, so I wanted to make a few comments on the results we have. Okay? So, uh, anyway, so this is where we start. I will mark uh, this as lecture 11.3. Yeah. And what I want to do is uh, make, of course, a few comments, right? Several comments, right? Uh, the first thing which is written here is, of course, that the initial excitation is a weaker condition than persistence excitation. That should be obvious from here itself. We spoke about it in the previous lecture, all right? That here you need uh, excitation to happen on all sliding windows time. And here the excitation is required only at initial time. All right. So that's should be obvious. Okay. The second thing is that uh, the original regressor y being initial ex initially exciting is sufficient for y f to be initially exciting. Yeah. So therefore, you don't need to verify initial excitation property on the filtered signal, but on the original signal itself is sufficient. Okay. This is rather useful. A um, few other comments, like I said, uh, I'm going to add a page in here. Yeah. Right. A few other comments. Uh, one. Right. So. 
comments on what we have obtained. Yeah. One, like I said, in the absence of uh, persistence or in, so in the absence of excitation of anything, of excitation, uh, robustness still an issue here. Yeah. So please don't think that uh, just because I did some new method, I got rid of persistence, I have initial excitation. Yes, initial excitation is easier to obtain than persistent excitation. Right? So if you have some excitation initially, it's okay, more than okay. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't have even that, then you still have a robustness issue in the presence of disturbance. Yeah, you, robustness still an issue here in the presence of disturbance yeah so you will have to resort to the same kind of methods yeah i mean um you um you will not have a big advantage here so remember that uh, remember what happens i mean if you go back here i mean this becomes more evident if you look at this yes there is theta tilde terms in this equation which is nice just like you know sigma epsilon modification but these terms are scaled by yif and yf transpose yf right and these are only semi-definite at best if you don't have excitation if you don't have any excitation then these are only semi-definite not definite therefore these terms may not contribute to giving you robustness okay so this is again a problem so i mean if you look at the Lyapunov analysis essentially you have this term right I mean, this is your actual term. This you get this term only after you have excitation. If you don't have excitation, you are left with this term. Yeah, and then you have some serious issues still, right? I mean, because this term is not necessarily this is not necessarily positive definite, right? It's only a negative definite, right? This is only semi-definite. Yeah, so you still have this non-strict kind of a Lyapunov function, which therefore means that you still have a robustness issue in the presence of disturbance. Yeah, so you have not resolved robustness per se okay great so i hope you understand that now uh, the second thing is of course that uh, it's an easier condition so if you have for example uh, right so if you if i try to draw some axes and what i'm going to do is try to draw two signals right so if this is a signal, for example, yeah, so this is a signal, uh, say I call it F1 of T, yeah, and then I have a signal which is say, you know, the same, but then after this it still continues. Yeah, and this signal is F2 of T. So it should be obvious to you that uh, uh, so it should be obvious to you that uh, F1 of T is initially exciting, not persistently exciting. And F2 of T both IE and PE. All right. So again, of course, it should also be evident to you. Therefore, I mean, so of course, a larger class of signals are initially exciting. Right? So it should be evident to you that uh, persistence excitation, persistent excitation implies IE, but IE initial excitation does not imply persistent excitation. Right. So this is important. Right. So therefore, this indicates that initial excitation is a weaker requirement okay? so therefore easier to satisfy you just need some excitation at some initial time and you're done okay? you, it's enough to identify things few more things if you look at this condition for excitation initial excitation this is sort of true even for persistent excitation right although these conditions are written as a function of time 
all right these are written as a function of time notice but in reality your yf yeah is an your yf is obtained how your yf is obtained by integrating y or filtering y and y contains the states right so yf in fact i i even written the expression right so the expression for yf is something like this where h is also depending on the state right so in reality uh, and this is the case for most problems that you will ever consider in reality y f uh t is actually y f x x dot t it depends on the states and its derivative or if you don't want to put the derivative because we got rid of it we using whatever some integration by parts it's a function of state and time right and if you see the definition here just like in case of the persistence also is only a function of time so then it begs the question what happens if yf is a function of the state so we come back to the same issue that we talked about when we discussed the integral lemma right we have to talk about notions like uh, need notions like lambda uniform initial excitation right so what was lambda uniform initial excitation it essentially says that uh, there exist t comma sigma 1 positive such that for all lambda in some domain integral 0 to t uh, y y f transpose t lambda y f t lambda dt is greater than or equal to sigma 1 identity right so basically we need lambda agnostic initial excitation type condition why why can we talk about a parameter and not a state because if you see if i plug in the solution here so this becomes a function of actually uh plug in solution and if i plug in the closed loop solution this is actually a function of uh i get y f um x0 t0 t right it's a function of just the initial time state yeah and time initial time initial state and time right and therefore these are parameters right? because these are constant values right so until now when we whatever we talked about is sort of non uniform results because we have to plug in a particular x0 t0 then we have to verify the integral condition like this yeah like this in fact sorry like this and then we have you know negative definiteness of yif and all the lyapunov analysis goes through and all that yeah but that is not very nice yeah the right way to go would be to define these notions of lambda uniform initial excitation which would be something like this in fact which is very identical to when we define lambda uniform persistence of excitation okay and the uh, you know integral lemma or it's very similar to that okay so if you have lambda uniform ie it means that for a particular set of initial time conditions uh, you will get you have this kind of uh, you know condition satisfied and then you will have your nice parameter convergence also along with tracking results okay so this is a very very important point remember what we did here until here is not uniform with respect to initial conditions time yeah and if you want to have uniformity with respect to initial conditions and time you have to de define the initial excitation differently you have to define it as lambda uniform initial excitation because in this case and in almost every case you will ever deal with your regressor invariably has a uh, dependence on states and yeah, this is almost uh, unavoidable yeah so this is again another very very important point 
uh, then of course you notice that i mean we we sort of talked about this earlier also but if you notice this uh, there is a state dependent term here which did not of course exist right which did not of course exist before this right uh, so now how to deal with it is uh, you know of course an interesting question uh, the way the authors have proposed you deal with it is of course adding this gain lambda which is only in the analysis and doesn't appear anywhere else yeah and so of course uh, you know you can you can sort of dominate this z term now this is a time in fact a state varying quantity so what does it mean dominated right because how do you talk about boundedness so this is a sort of cyclical question right this works fine it's not a big issue uh, if you choose a large enough lambda to begin with then this is negative term this is a nice negative term so v dot is negative semi definite v is non increasing therefore states are bounded okay and from that you get some bound on the states and from that i get some bound on the z using that bound on the z i will get another value of lambda okay i will get another value of lambda all right and uh from that is how i choose i will choose my lambda so this is the very interesting point so so in fact i will probably put it more carefully more precisely here uh, how to choose lambda again may not be very important for you but it is important for any theoretician analyst to understand how this choice of lambda is made so remember what you end up doing by choosing lambda is proving vt is less than equal to v0 all right so which means that you have your uh, half norm e square plus lambda norm theta tilde square where in this case e is just scalar so i'm going to just say e square yeah is less than equal to uh, half e squared at zero plus lambda theta tilde squared at zero yeah all right and now uh, with this i of course want to get a bound on e i want to get a bound on e right so if i if i look at it conservatively i can say that e squared at t is less than in fact i will remove the square root this is e of t is less than equal to square root of uh, e squared 0 plus lambda norm theta tilde 0 square okay yeah i hope you understand because i know that the sum is less than this therefore each term has to be less than this also i have taken a conservative value because that's the best you will be able to do in this situation and then i have taken a square root on both sides great now that i have this bound what do i know about the z in this particular case z is basically 0x right so then i will you can say that norm of z is equal to uh, x in fact right which is less than equal to right because r is the trajectory that i am trying to track so this is of course if i take a bound on the trajectory is bounded so if i take the upper bound as rm so this is less than equal to square root of e squared 0 plus lambda norm theta tilde 0 squared plus rm this is my bound on norm z right and now what do i need 
I need my lambda to dominate this. Right? So this is the interesting thing here, right? And now see this. What do I need? I will actually. I need that. So what do I need? I need that lambda mu i f sigma one. Yeah, should be greater than norm z t squared divided by two. Yeah, for all t. For all t. Okay. So in fact, this is I mean because this is an upper bound, so it should be evident that so. Because this doesn't depend on time, it should be evident that for all t this bound holds. The right hand side doesn't depend on time. So for all time t, this bound has to hold. Right? So obviously you want this to be if this is greater than square root of e squared 0 plus lambda uh, norm theta tilde 0 squared. Yeah, plus Rm uh, whole squared by 2. Yeah. Now, uh, if I want to keep this simple, I mean, actually, I can't keep this very simple to be honest. Uh, the, there is a little bit of a, a complication here, right? I mean, I, it's not that the solution doesn't exist here. Right? The solution does exist. I mean, you should be able to find a solution here. Uh, the only thing is that there is a lambda on both sides. Yeah, there is a lambda on both sides of this equation. Yeah, so it's like solving a quadratic. Yeah, so not super um, obvious how to get this lambda, but there does exist such a lambda. All right, so I hope you remember this this sort of a uh, slightly complicated sort of situation that we land ourselves in okay, with this choice of lambda. Okay, now uh, if if Initial excitation is not there, then we are in a rather big soup. Okay, because then we are left with this kind of a term. Okay, and this is not even positive definite. Yeah, if there is no initial excitation, then this term uh, could a, is not positive definite. Okay, let's remember that this term is not positive definite here then it's not very clear how this kind of a term can be dominated okay so uh, so to be honest if you look at this behavior in the absence of excitation is not evident yeah, I hope this is clear. If there is no excitation, then I'm left with this kind of a Lyapunov function derivative, candidate function derivative. And then this term is not positive definite, so I can't really use this term to dominate anything. Yeah, and then I'm left with this term where this E can be managed here, sure. But then there is still some kind of a term in theta tilde. Yeah, so at best I'll get some kind of a residual set type of it starts to look like the sigma epsilon modification type of the situation. Okay. Unless I can somehow smartly use this term. Not very clear, to be honest. Yeah, that's not very clear whether it will be possible. It is obvious that this yif is connected to this theta because yif is connected to y. Yeah. Um yeah, it's not super obvious. Okay, it's not super evident how to use this. Of course, if you retain this term also, you will still have a y again a semi-definite term. Uh, again, may have some connection to z. So this may help you dominate this uh, even in the absence of excitation. But it is not very evident how that would be possible. It is a little bit more of a complicated proposition. All right. So excellent. So as always, when you get something, you also give something. Right. I mean. Of course, you uh, already gave something in in the in the form of adding more dynamics, right? I mean, you increase the order of the system, 
right if you uh, you know so yif is typically uh, the the size of yif is more like the size of the regressor right so y, the size of y is basically the size of uh, theta so it is like you know in this case one parameter so one additional parameter so two so in this case it became 1 by 2 so therefore yf is also 1 by 2 and if yf is 1 by 2 then yif uh, became a 2 by 2 matrix so you added significant number of states to your system okay so you already did uh, ask for something more but uh, on top of that you can see that there are some um, things that may uh, still be a little bit complicated especially things like the choice of lambda and then what happens in the absence of this initial excitation right in the persistence excitation in the absence of persistence excitation you still know that you get uh, you know tracking convergence right zero tracking errors in this case this is not very clear whether such a thing is happening okay it may be possible for large values of k and lambda and such but it's not very clear in fact uh so ideally uh, it would make sense to sort of combine the uh, usual certainty equivalence pe adaptive law and this law is what would be sort of my recommendation but of course i have not uh, done that and so shown it here i leave it to you folks to try it out all right excellent so what we uh, looked at in this session is that we had completed the analysis for the initial excitation uh, based adaptive controller for a single integrator Uh, in the previous session we wanted to have a discussion of what the properties are of this okay so we looked at a few rather interesting things interesting features uh, the positives in the sense that it's initial excitation and not persistent excitation and the fact that all p signals are initially exciting and not vice versa uh, but then we also saw some drawbacks such as how to choose lambda what happens in the absence of initial excitation Uh, so there are a few uh, drawbacks also to how we do things all right so it is rather important to keep this in mind uh, when we are using the initial excitation based design in the end like i said i propose that you sort of use a combination of the ce adaptation law and the i adaptation law or the p adaptation law and the i adaptation law but again that's not something i have shown here in this discussion i leave it to you folks to try it out and see how it works uh in the upcoming session we will look at uh, again back stepping extensions for this so we just want to integrate it with what we have learnt and i hope you see that it's not too difficult to do that yeah uh, the most important thing to remember is that uh, the in the initial excitation based adaptive control design the adaptive control law the update law is design is completely decoupled from the dynamics so dynamics almost plays no role because everything is in terms of the y yf and yif so whatever is inside this y and yf and yif is what captures the dynamics the structure of the parameter update law remains the same irrespective of the dynamics therefore it is very easy to stretch this to any dynamical system all right and so it has found use in many different dynamical systems and that's rather nice all right so great i hope you enjoyed this session and i hope you will join me again next time thank you